Chapters 5 and 6 of The Haunted House on Duchess Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. The Haunted House on Duchess Street. Chapter 5 The Catastrophe in the House. On a certain Sunday night, which was destined to be memorable in the annals of the Duchess Street house, the number of Captain Bywater's guests was smaller than usual. They consisted of only three persons. One, Henry John Porter, an article clerk in the office of Simon Washburn. Mr. Washburn was a well-known lawyer of those times, whose office was on the corner of Duke and George Streets. He acted professionally for the Redoubt family, and had the letting and sale of the Duchess Street property. It was probably through this circumstance that his clerk had become acquainted with Captain Bywater. 2. James McDougall, who was employed in some subordinate capacity in the civil service. 3. Alfred Jordan Pilkey, whose occupation seems to have been nothing in particular. What had become of the other regular attendants does not appear. Not only were the guests few in number on this particular evening, but the proceedings themselves seem to have been of a much less noisy character than ordinary. It was noticed that the host was somewhat out of humor, and that he displayed signs of ill-temper which were not usual with him. His demeanor reflected itself upon his company, and the fun was neither fast nor furious. In fact, the time passed somewhat drearily, and the satyrant broke up at the unprecedentedly early hour of eleven o'clock. The man-servant saw the company out, locked the door, and repaired to the room upstairs where his master still lingered, to see if anything more was required of him. The captain sat in a large armchair by the fire, sipping a final glass of grog. He seemed gloomy and dispirited, as though he had something on his mind. In response to Jim's inquiry whether he wanted anything, he growled out, "'No, go to bed and be hanged to you!' Jim took him at his word, so far as the first clause of the injunction was concerned. He went to bed in his room on the opposite side of the hallway. In passing through the hall, he perceived Nero lying asleep on the mat in front of his master's bedroom, which was the small room in the rear of the large apartment where the meetings were held. Jim had not been in bed many minutes, and was in a tranquil state between sleeping and waking, when he heard his master emerge from the front room, pass along the hallway, as though about to enter his bedchamber. Another moment, and he was roused from his half-somnolent condition by the hearing of the sharp report of a pistol shot, followed by a sound from Nero, something between a moan and a howl. He sprang to the floor, but ere he could make his way into the hall, he was well-nigh stunned by hearing a tremendous crash, as though some large body had been hurled violently down the stairs from top to bottom. A vague thought of robbers flashed through his brain, and he paused for a moment, as he himself afterwards admitted, half paralyzed with fright. He called aloud upon his master, and then upon the dog, but received no response from either. The crash of the falling body was succeeded by absolute silence. Pulling his nerves together, he struck a match lighted his candle, and passed in fear and trembling into the hallway. The first sight that greeted his eyes was the seemingly lifeless body of Nero, lying stretched out at the head of the stairs. Upon approaching the body, he found blood trickling from a wound in the poor brute's throat. One of the captain's pistols lay on the floor, close by. But where was the captain himself? Shading his eyes and holding the candle before him, he peered fearfully down the stairway, but the darkness was too profound to admit of his seeing to the bottom. By this time a foreshadowing of the truth had made its way to his understanding. He crept gingerly down the stairs, slowly, step by step, holding the candle far in advance, and anon calling upon his master by name. He had passed more than half the way down before he received full confirmation of his forebodings. There, lying at full length across the hallway, between the foot of the stairs and the front door, was the body of Remy Arrington's murderer, with the sinister evil face turned up to the ceiling. His left arm, still grasping a candlestick, was doubled under him, and his body, in its impetuous descent, had torn away the lower portion of the balustrade. The distraught serving man raised the head on his arm, and by means as occurred to him, sought to ascertain whether any life still lingered there. He could find no pulsation at the wrist, but upon applying his ear to the left side, he fancied he could detect a slight fluttering of the heart. Then he rushed to the kitchen, and returned with a pitcher of water, which he dashed in the prostrate face. As this produced no apparent effect, he ran back upstairs to his bedroom, threw on part of his clothes, and made his way at full speed to the house of Dr. Pritchard on Newgate Street. The doctor was a late bird, and had not retired to rest. He at once set out for Duchess Street, 
Jim Summers going round by the house of his sister-in-law on Palace Street to arouse his wife, who slept there. Upon receiving his wife's promise to follow him as soon as she could huddle on her clothing, Jim ran on in advance, and reached the Duchess Street house only a minute or two later than Dr. Pritchard. The doctor had been there long enough, however, to ascertain that the captain's neck was broken, and that he was where no human aid could reach him. He would preside over no more orgies in the large room on the upper story. CHAPTER Six: THE INQUEST IN THE HOUSE There was an inquest. That, under the circumstances, was a matter of course. But nothing of importance was elicited beyond what has already been noted. Porter, MacDougall, and Pilkey all attended, and gave evidence to the effect that Captain Bywater was tolerably drunk when they left him at eleven, but that he was, upon the whole, the most sober of the party, and apparently quite capable of taking care of himself. They had noticed his uncongenial mood, but could afford no conjecture as to the cause. It was impossible to suspect anything in the shape of foul play. The obvious conclusion to be arrived at was that the captain's long-drinking bouts had produced their legitimate result, and that at the moment when he met his death he was suffering from, or on the verge, of delirium tremens. He generally carried a loaded pistol in his breast pocket. He had found the dog asleep on the mat before his bedchamber. It was probably asleep, or, at all events, it did not hasten to get out of his way, and in a moment of insane fury or drunken stupidity, he had drawn forth his weapon, and shot the poor brute dead. He had just then been standing near the top of the stairs. The quantity of liquor he had drunk was sufficient to justify the conclusion that he was not as steady on his pins as a sober man would have been. He had overbalanced himself, and— and that was the whole story. The coroner's jury brought in a verdict in accordance with the facts, and the captain's body was put to bed with the sexton's spade. A will, drawn up in due form in the office of Mr. Washburn, and properly signed and attested, had been made by the deceased a short time after taking possession of the place on Duchess Street. His fortune chiefly consisted of an income of five hundred pounds sterling per annum, secured on real estate situated in Gloucestershire, England. This income lapsed upon his death, and it had thus been unnecessary to make any testamentary provision respecting it, except as to the portion which should accrue between the last quarter day and the death of the testator. This portion was bequeathed to an elder brother, residing in Gloucestershire. All the other property of the deceased was bequeathed to Mr. Washburn, in trust to dispose of such personal belongings as did not consist of ready money, and to transmit the proceeds, together with all the cash in hand, to the said elder brother in Gloucestershire. The latter provisions were duly carried into effect by Mr. Washburn within a few days after the funeral, and it might well have been supposed that the good people of York had heard the last of Captain Bywater and his affairs. But they hadn't. End of chapter 6